I'm normal sort of working class person, come come from nothing. It's a long struggle and you know, businesses are not an overnight success. You know, back in, I think it was the early 90s uh, recession, nearly went bust, you know what I mean? I actually went and see two liquidators and he said, look, you're gonna lose your house, you might as well fight for it. If you, if you don't fight for it, you've lost it. If you fight for it, you might still have it. That's what I've done, fought for it. Here we are today, like the you know, largest independent company in London. Not only has it brought us in the large figure, 150 mil, it's given us 200 mil over 40 years and uh, yeah, that's, that's a lot of dosh, isn't it? Charlie Mullins, OBE, which he was awarded back in 2015, is known for being the founder of a very successful plumbing firm called Pimlico Plumbers. He established this company back in 1979 in his basement with one van. At the height, it was turned over 70 million roughly a year with over 400 people working for him. He then sold in 2022, his stake for close to 150 million pound, but it wasn't all plain sailing. He nearly lost the business on a few occasions and Charlie shares with me how we overcame adversity. I believe you're gonna find this podcast very, very interesting. If you're looking to get into business, Charlie's definitely someone that can motivate you and inspire you. Please be happy, never content. Right, welcome back to another episode of my podcast, Steve Sully Study. As everybody knows, I like to interview go-getters, entrepreneurs, athletes, because I believe these are the people that drive the world forward and also entertain us. And these are the individuals that we can learn from. A guy in front of me, someone I'm, I, I, I've actually been sort of following on and off for, for the last few years. Um, I used to see you in my area, in Locks Bottom, yeah, between Creston Park and Farnborough Park. And the way I knew it was you, Charlie, is because of the number plate on, it was an old, it was an older Bentley. It was before the Mulzan. I can't remember yeah. the, the, the actual model of it now. And I always used to look at you and think, oh my God, that is a, like an inspiration. One day I would love to live in this area and drive a car like that. And now I'm interviewing Mr. Charlie Mullins. So welcome aboard on the podcast, mate. Yeah, well, that's good to hear, Steve. And um, yeah, look, you just said the first word there, inspiration. And we all learn from somebody. We all see something that we like. And that's exactly how I learn. I used to work with a plumber. I used to bunk off school uh, when I was about 10 years of age and uh, helped the local plumber. And he had a car, motorbike, nice house, money, all of this, nice clothes. He just seemed to have everything. And, and I was working with him in all these lovely rich houses in Parliament Hill and Amsterdam and all around there. And, uh, and, and it just inspired me so much. He used to always have like loads of dosh on him. And, you know, I was taken by it. And, 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 you know, the seeds were sown then when I was about nine or 10, just by seeing all of that. And, and, I used to always say that if he would have been a bank robber, I'd have been a bank robber because the seeds were sown. And it's a bit like what you just said. You see the car, you see the area, and you want to do that. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. So uh, the first lesson there for anyone listening to this, especially a young male, young female, wants to become a go-getter, entrepreneur, or even an athlete or some kind of business person, surrounding yourself with people that, not necessarily that you know directly, but even if it's in your further circle, you know, friends of friends who might be achieving something, how important is that? Yeah, well, well, again, we all learn from somebody. So, you, you know, you, you look up at somebody, whether it be an athlete, whether it be a business guy, whether whether it be, what else, what else do people do? Business, athletic, athletic thing, that's about it, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I might become a professional as a doctor or a pilot, but, you know, really and truly, they're either an athlete or they're some kind of business person or they're inside a business becoming like a like a entrepreneur entrepreneur yeah. but inside that business yeah. look i suppose really it's, it's a it's a very wide field it doesn't matter if you're selling sandwiches or you know you're working in a gym if you if you want to achieve something and inspire then you've got to learn off somebody you've got to watch somebody and think i can do that i'm going to try to do that and uh, i think it's very important that you know i don't necessarily say you have to look up to that person but you can sort of respect and admire that person and think well you know i wouldn't mind doing half as good as them and i think it's important as much as i say to anybody think big but also think realistic and uh you know it, it, it's more of a level playing field out there now than ever and what with such as this podcast that are out there and 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 very uh other business programs on the telly the um not that i'm a lover of it, the apprentice but the uh, what's the other one? The Peter Jones one. What is it? The uh, Dragon's Den. That's it. All of them are great learning things. And um, 
you know, you just got to look at these things and then get inspired by something and then uh, make it happen. Yeah. Speaking of Peter Jones, I watched a program, I think it was 2007, 2008, and he'd done a series over like three or four, and you were one of the guests on this program. I think originally it was all, there was a program which was Richard Reed and Michelle Moan, which was called How We Made Our Millions. Yeah. And um, that done so well, then he'd done like a, a three or four part, and you was, you was on there. And I always remember listening to you and saying that you were a fan and you actually used to do a bit of boxing back in the day. Oh, undoubtedly. Um, yeah. yeah, undoubtedly on that. I mean, uh, I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for boxing because, you know, I think any sport that you go into, it gives you uh, discipline, it gives you the will to want to win, the will to want to achieve things. And of course, fit body is a fit mind. So, you know, I think even now, you know, as you can see, I still train. Been to the gym today. And... Um, and I think it just sort of, you know, it just keeps you going. So not everyone's athletical, but all I'm saying is if you are, it's a great plus to pushing yourself forward. Did you have any uh, boxing fights or bouts when you were younger? Yeah, of course. Yeah, me. how many? Um, about 25 amateur fights. And, uh, you know, obviously one more than I lost. Um, well, not obviously, but unfortunately I, I, I came out of boxing with an head injury. Okay. And uh, that was end of, end of the job kind of thing. I was against London versus Wales. Got knocked out um, in, in that one. And anyhow, look, you move on from that. I, I mean, it, you're going to get many knocks on the way, whether you're a boxer, whether you're in business, whether you're you know just, just trying to achieve something. And uh, the most important thing is that you get up and carry on. And if... If you can't go down that route no more, you know, there's plenty of other routes. There's more than one way to skin a cat. Yeah. Look, I wouldn't class myself as a mentor as of yet because I'm only 36 years of age. And until I sell a company for over £100 million, then I might turn around to someone and say, look, I might be a bit of a mentor. But when I've had younger people ask me a bit of advice about business or becoming a go-getter, I would, I'd say, number one, learn the art of selling. Because I think if you can sell, you can go into any brand, any company and sell your service, sell your brand, sell yourself, which is important. But also do boxing. At least do sports, but do some kind of boxing because it gives you that mindset that when things are not going so right, you can stay composed. Your your mind is on the success. You need to become methodical. And, you know, life is a bit like a boxing match. When there's a recession, that's like being on the back foot. So if you can learn to adapt and pivot during that, those moments, I think it really helps you in business. So the reason why I asked you about your boxing career, even as an amateur, how much of that, the lessons that you learned in boxing has transferred over into your business? Yeah, a hell of a lot because first of all, the, the you know, as a boxer, you, you always want to be winning and you want to be first and, you know, you, you, you put so much into it. And, you know, I, I think because my boxing career ended when I was 21, and, you know, I just finished my apprenticeship then. So all my time then was devoted to running a business. But the boxing helped tremendously, you know, because you're very disciplined and, you know, you're also respectful to people. And, and all them things help in, in, in business. And, um, you know, I don't think you take people for, for mugs. You know what I mean? You treat people the way you'd like to be treated. And uh, you also makes, it makes you very confident, as you know. Of course. Um, not necessarily because you can fight, but just the fact that, um, you know, you're fit, you're healthy, you understand a lot more. Um, and, you know, you sell boxing trainers, you know, they don't put up with no shit. And that, yeah. that's how you have to be in business. Yeah. But you, you, it's great to be a boxer, it's great to be an athlete, but... I'm just going to say that's not for everybody. So, you know, you've got as much chance of making it whether you're an athlete or not an athlete. It's all about determination, who you're going to learn off and, and how much you want it. Yeah. I know you've got four kids. Um, so any of them got into sports and specifically boxing? Yeah, yeah. I have two girls, two boys. Um, they're all uh, quite old now. They've got their own children. Um so I've got 10 grandchildren, three great-grandchildren. I know you think I don't look old enough, but I am. <laughs> uh, yeah, so two of them was boxing, Scott and Sam, a box for the uh, Fisher Club. And then Sam's still a trainer now. Um, he has his own club, Churchill. He's got quite a lot of professional fighters and um, a lot of women fighters, a lot of men fighters, doing wonderful. So he stayed in the boxing. That's, that's his life. And... Um, and doing very well at it, yeah. Good man, good man. I want to jump to a big question like the jugular for me, okay? Because I'm really interested personally and I know the audience will be. So, of course, you founded the brand back in uh, 1979, Pimlico Plumbers. 
there's obviously loads of different stories online. Um, said that you started it with a van and you was in the basement and you were self-employed and then scaled it up. I, I read that you was either turning over 50 or 70 million pound a year. Um, you had over 400 uh, employees. Um, there was times where, you know, you were against the ropes, you know, where... Uh, against the ropes, well done, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the actually, com- actually on the floor, let alone yeah. on the canvas. <laughs> okay. And, uh, you know, you were against it a little bit. And I think the true measurement of a successful person is can be, yes, the amount of money they've got and all their accolades, but it's really, and it's, I know it's going to sound cheesy, but when you get knocked down and then you get back up and then you come back even stronger, bigger and better, and that's what you've done. Yeah. So last year, I read that you sold 90% of Pimlico Plumbers. Uh, your your son, Scott, retained 10%. The report said anything between 125, 145 million pounds. And let's just assume right now, I know you can't p- pin the actual number, but let's just assume it's close to 150 million, okay? Uh, you're, you're spot on. Okay. Um, what is it like getting 150 million pounds for a company that you founded back in 1979? Yeah, it's, look, it, it, it's it's amazing, and uh, you know, it's an unbelievable thing, and it probably still don't sink in. You know, I mean, I'm normal sort of working class person, come come from nothing, um, and you know, life's always been struggle, and married early, and you know, children early, but you know, it, it, it's sort of all stepping stones. But it's fantastic having that type of dosh, but in the same token. Um, you know, it's given me a better life and, and many people that, that are around me a better life. Um, but I'm just going to add this. It's not be all and end all, but it's, it's a, look, it's, I wouldn't want to be without it. Like Michael Caine, he's been poor and he's been rich. He knows which one he prefers. And, and it's obvious that it's a great thing. But you also, as you know, Steve, to, to get to that, you know what I mean? You, you, your balls are on the line. You, you know, you've been down many times and you're getting knocked and there's many hurdles. And, you know, I don't know if you know, but, and, and you're right, I did start in a basement, one van and, and um, uh, well, a van. I mean, I eventually got a basement room in Pimlico, but it's a long struggle. And, you know, businesses are not an overnight success. They're, they're, they're for the long haul. So, um, you know, I'm a great believer in slow starter, strong finisher. And 40 years down the line, I think Pimlico was 41 years before I sold it. And you're right, 450 people on board. We, we got to a 50 mil turnover and we was absolutely booming. And um, very much a family business. I had about 10 members of family in there. And, um, you know, it just, you know, look, it went from strength to strength. But, you know, back in, I think it was the early 90s uh, recession, nearly went bust, you know what I mean? Unfortunately, I'd borrowed some dosh off... Um, of a bank, I won't say who it is, but it's Barclays, and um, and 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 they try and like have you over, you know what I mean? They wanted their dosh back, and you know I bought this building to get us really going, and uh, it was just the wrong bit of timing because of the recession, and you know I borrowed the dosh in December 1990 in April. They're screaming their head off, they want it back, and you know, and all of a sudden I put my ass up. Um, up for um, what do you call it? Uh, mortgage. Yeah, yeah. What do they call it though? Asset. Re- re- yeah, yeah. Re- you know, like like oh. the guarantee thing. Yeah. Anyhow, family home, and you imagine at that time four kids at home and the fucking bank screaming. They want they want their ass back. They want the they want their dosh. You know what I mean? And um, you know, I've never dealt with banks since. You know, what I mean, I have to be honest. A bad experience, and I think they're crooks in suits. You know what I mean? But fortunately, worked hard, got through it. And uh, obviously, if you if you do do that, you come out the other side better, as you said earlier. And uh, I remember my accountant saying at the time that if we get through this, Charlie, um, you know, you'll come out the other end a lot better. At that time, we turned over a million pounds, which is still a lot of dosh. And then, you know, at the end of the day, we then turn over 50 mil. Uh, and that's like, say, 25 years later kind of thing. Um, but, you know, as I say, you know, you're down a lot. There's a lot of sleepless nights. There's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul. There's a lot of stress on it. That's the downside. But the good side is, you know, you know, look at me now. Look at many other people now that have a successful business. I mean, there's, there's no business like a successful business. Absolutely. So if I can ask, I was going to ask you about the money, but I'll come on to that in a second. When the banks were breathing down your neck, and they were uh, yeah. becoming a bit ruthless towards yeah. you. What did you learn about yourself and what did you learn about the people around you in that moment in time? Wow, yeah. 
uh, what I learned about myself is that we, 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 we all can be, you know, you can all be knocked out, you know what I mean? I was very close to going. I actually went and see two liquidators to wrap it up. And uh, first one, uh, funny enough, he was uh, Lennox Lewis's uh, manager, the, the guy. Went and see him and uh, he went, how much you got? Nothing. How much you owe? About 350, 350. He went, well, you know, it's not, it's not rocket science, you need to go. He said, and start again. And I'm like, fuck me, you know, I'm going to lose my ass and everything. And, uh, you know, but he, he wasn't concerned about that. All he wanted was his bit of dosh and, you know. And then uh, my my accountant, who I got a new accountant, he said to me, look, let's get a second opinion. So I'm a great believer in second opinions. We went to another guy and he said, same questions. And he said, look, you're going to lose your ass. You might as well fight for it. And and, and it was that words that, you know, fight, let's go for it kind of thing. And he, he said, you know, if you, if you don't fight for it, you've lost it. If you fight for it, you might still have it. And I sort of done fought for it and carried on, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, you don't really, when you've got to dig deep, you know, yourself, you've got to dig deep. And um, and I think then, I have to be honest, I think the boxing thing came into it because, you know, yourself, if you're knocked on the floor, you've got no, no choice but to get up or if not your finished job. And uh, that's what I've done, fought for it. And uh, yeah, here we are today, like the you know, largest independent company in London, definitely the, the, the most recognised uh, plumbing company in the world. And um, it's been tremendous. And, and uh, as much as you mentioned a figure about 150, now it's all wrapped up um, that we, we received for it. I also, uh, my accountant said over the years that I've run it, I've had over 200 mil out of that company coming to me you know i'm not saying i've obviously i ain't spent all that but you know i've got a few quid invested and um you know and and, and other people have benefited for you know for me i mean obviously we get involved with charities and that type of thing but not only has it brought us in the large figure 150 mil it's given us 200 mil over 40 years and uh yeah that's, that's a lot of dosh isn't it yeah, it's beautiful beautiful um just on the note of uh, the quotes of fighting and, and you know getting up off the floor, uh, I read a quote once which, I, which I've used a few times. If you fight, you're not guaranteed to win, but if you don't fight, you're guaranteed to, to lose. lose. Yeah, of course. And it's so true, isn't it? Yeah, you know, of in, course. In, in life and in business, you literally have that choice. Yeah, exactly. We all have a choice whether you know we, we, we want to just be normal and plod along, and there ain't nothing wrong with that. Or we have a choice if we want to achieve a bit more, and then we have another choice. Do we want to be a leader? And, uh, you know, it's fairly obvious. You're a leader. I'm a leader. And many people are leaders. But there's no, nothing wrong with, you know, you don't ain't always got to be at the top of the tree. You, you know, you can, you can work for a company and benefit, like, very well. Like, all my guys, you know, was on... Uh, what was that on two grand two grand hundred so sometimes about 150k a year as a plumber and they've all bought houses they've bought lovely cars and you know they've gone on to achieve things so it's not necessarily means you've got to be top guy you've just got to be you know you, you've just got to liven up a bit and uh, you know there's nothing wrong with trying to achieve better things in your life Definitely. So, look, there's, there's going to be some misconceptions because of what the media have said and how, let's say, younger people perceive that when you sell a brand or you get a brand to 100 million, 200 million, a billion, they believe that, for example, Ben Francis, who um, owns Gymshark, yep. he got the brand to like a, a billion, then two billion. There was a couple, I think he either he got investment in or he floated the company yeah. or something like that. And many believe, because of the way the, the articles were written, that he received a billion pound in his bank account. And when he was interviewed on multiple different podcasts, he said, no, that's not how it works. I've got, obviously, a substantial amount of money, yeah. but then I received other elements. So was it 150 million, let's call it, into your bank account, or was it in dribs and drabs, or how did you receive it? No, fuck me. I mean, I wouldn't let no one owe me money, would I? Yeah. No, of course. I mean, look, they paid the, the money, the Americans, uh, neighbourly. Uh, they wanted the company badly. We had we had quite a, a, um, a big interest in it from all over the world, from uh, Saudi Arabia, from Dubai, France, uh, and quite a few in in uh, England. I mean, it was a great company, a great money maker. Um, but you know, you know, you know, I mean, you strike a deal, and you you know, I mean, I don't allow people to owe me money. Um, you know, that's pointless. You know, yeah. I mean, I mean, look, ere the company was successful after had this up until. When the recession came in 1991-92, we used to do credit to people and let them owe us. Once we nearly went bust, I, I, I come up with a system payment on completion. 
So everybody had to pay us, and that's what changed the company. It meant that we had money. We never had money owing. Most people that go bust, they go because someone owes them money. And, and, and it was all my clients owed us about 80 grand. And, uh, you know, I had an overdraft at the time. And imagine it was uh, robbing us like, of, of the bank. But so I, I turned it into payment on completion. And, and then I learned you've got to set your own rules, right? It's your business. Set your own rules. You know, if, if you want people to be smart and tidy, you want them to work X amount of days a week. If you want a clean and tidy van. So I've done a book of rules called like the Pimlico Bible and we just stuck to that and and one of the terms was payment on completion and and we used to do a lot of celebrity clients or still do I think you know where well, well, Roger Moore like um what's your name uh, uh what's your name the fucking singer geezer uh Robbie Williams and um Dame Ellen Mirren and Joanna Lumley um Daniel Craig we, we do so many celebrity people and, and normal people know, I think the point I'm trying to say is, no matter who you are, you, if you, we do a job for you, it's payment on completion. I used to say to people, if the Queen rung us, and if she couldn't give us a kite at the time, or, or credit card, we wouldn't do the job. So it's important to stick to a policy that will make sure that you survive in business. Um, and I just say to anybody, if you run a business, run it under your terms, don't, don't let the tail wag the dog. Yeah, really, really important stuff. I'm going to get on to like, you know, there's so many things that Pimbaclo plumbers are known for and it's because of everything that you put in place, which my, I, you know, hats off to you. I think what you've done there is incredible. Last thing about the money though, okay? Because I'm just intrigued. That's right. You've always been a man when I used to see you drive around in the Bentleys and stuff, you know, got class about you, you know, own nice stuff, lovely houses. I mean, I'm even still hearing stories like, you know, just, just I don't know whether Chinese whispers no. or, or whatever else, but... You've always had money and you've always enjoyed your money, okay? Um, when you receive 150 million low, I mean, you've already got everything you kind of want. What do you, What was the first thing you bought with 150 million? Uh, the apartment that I, I'm in now, like on the mill bank there, um, they didn't want to sell it, but I've upped the bid and I just got it for 10 mil. Lovely. So I'm over the moon with that. Good stuff. Um, and what about like the toys, the Ferraris, the the cars? Well, I'm not a Ferrari man, to be honest. You know, I mean, I, I, I've got a few Bentleys. Um, I've always, you know, my ambition when I was, I used to be an apprentice and um, be in a dirty little van, like going to work and all that, like with all rusty at the bottom, feet hanging out. And I used to see a Bentley or Rolls Royce go to work and I used to say, anyone with me and they'll go that'll be me one day that'll be me and again it's you 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 get that and you see something and you want it and i think i was i thought i was dreaming at the time just mm. you know just, oh, i said that'll be me one day and then when as soon as i got a bent and i started going to work in it i was like and then of course people are looking at me and going that'll be me one day yeah. that'll be me and uh so but you said something i've always had money i haven't always had money i, I had i had money once the company got successful uh and uh you know once it gets going properly um it's great and yeah i've always had i've had since that nice cars nice holidays lovely homes um yeah lo lo lovely everything kind of thing but um you know you, you have well you know anyhow that um nothing's for nothing and, and you know it's all come from determination and hard work and sacrifice yeah and i don't believe in luck steve you know what i mean Maybe i mean not. people keep saying to me oh you're lucky you're lucky well if i was lucky i wouldn't have been working like 24 hours a day and fucking sleepless nights and and you know going out on more emergency jobs and you know yourself employing people is is, is risky taking on a um you know office space it's all risky and you know if i had to rely on luck you know what i mean then why 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 would you do all them things but you know i don't believe in luck i just believe in um determination willpower um and drive yeah, it's yeah. important. Reason why I said that you always have money is because I meant in my lifetime. Because when I was younger, I used to see you driving around. Yeah. Obviously, I'm 36, so you've always been a person in my mind that is perceived to always have have money. So, okay, so the standards that Pimlico plumber plumbers have got now, and what you installed, like how did you come up with these kind of almost regimented yeah, ways rules, ways rules. and 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 almost business lifestyle things yeah. that your staff and your brand had to adhere to how did you come up yeah. with that well look um so i wrote wrote we wrote this book out you know you can't wear trainers you can't have ponytails can't have earrings no facial tattoos um you know but I, I, so what had happened you know uh, when i was an apprentice i used to go to jobs um you know with a plumber and 
the customer's always my like, plumber ain't turned up, dirty old van, arse hanging out his trousers, didn't clean up, didn't, wasn't, didn't tell me how much, didn't finish the job. And, and I thought, I don't want all that people moaning at me when I'm, in, when I'm working. So I, all I'd done then was done the opposite. I just wrote a book of 20 bad things in the industry and then, you know, say it was plumber turning up late. So I put down, you know, we must be on time kind of thing. Scruffy bastard, smart guys, um, not transparent. So I've done transparent. So I just reversed all the bad things. And it's not complicated. So any business you're in, don't matter if you're selling clothes or making cups of tea, think of all the things that people are unhappy about and just do the opposite. And normally the opposite is the right way. I always say that... Pimlico plumbers, it's not that we've done anything clever, it's just that all the others, you know, done all the rubbish stuff. Mm. You know, if you do it right, you're on a winner. And, um, you, you, you know, I set that in and, and it sort of changed the image of plumbing. All of a sudden, everybody started up in their game and, you know, we had sign written vans and they was never have a dirty van on the road. And, you know, yourself, the, um, you know, when you, when you first see somebody, the, um, I can't think what it is, you know, what, what is it? What's that thing when you, you know, um, you know, you first, you, what's it called when you look at, you first see someone or... First impressions. Yeah, but what's the other thing? It's, it's your... Um, Persona? No, not that. The thing where you... Oh, your know. image? Image, no, but it's a, it's a thing when you sort of say, you, you sort of take people as you see them, right? You know, so, you know, if you see a smart plumber, you're going to get a smart job. Yeah. If you see a scruffy plumber, chances are you get a scruffy job. Yeah. And, and I think that's across the board. And... So I reversed all the things, do it the right way, and um, and then obviously over and above, you know what I mean? You've got to do that. And, um, you know, being very transparent was, was one of the m major changes of the company. Um, and, and then it was it was like we just got known as a quality service. And I'm a, I'm a great believer, well, I, I'll say this anyway, people will always pay for quality. It's like, you know, you can go and buy a suit, 300 sobs, and that's nothing wrong with that. Or you can go Savile Row and buy one for five grand. But people will always pay for quality. So, you know, Savile Row is never going to go skin. Mm. And, and, and I believe whatever product you do, whatever business you do, the most important thing is quality of service, quality of product. Definitely, definitely. Um, your, you said something earlier there that, well, you said something in many podcasts, which is it's important that when, you're, when you've got this pie, that everybody in your organisation shares some of it. And yeah. your, your, your plumber has always been known to earn, earning a few quids. You know, they were earning more, um, more than the average plumber. Well, some, yeah. of them, some of them are earning over 100 grand a year, yeah. which is kind of unheard of. I mean, if you think some doctors don't even earn that, you know? Yeah, well, look, you know, I'll come up with a thing in the end that uh, good plumbers will earn more than any bank manager. You know, some was on 200 grand, some was on 180 grand. Look, it's important that you give uh, people that you're working with incentives. And, and you know, I'm a great believer that so there's nothing better than making sure they earn good money. And then we brought in loads of things. We used to have a gym that every, all, everyone on workers could use, subsidised canteen, roof garden, barbecues in the week, big Christmas party, boat party, lady who used to come and do massage in the week. No, no uh, dodgy one. Like, no you know, the back one. No happy ending. <laughs> but it was back, but that was for all the office staff. And, you know, it incentivized people to come to work. And just as an example, when the, when the uh, pandemic was out there um, and the government are giving people money to sit at home and do nothing, we give people more money to come to work as an incentive. And uh, believe me, it paid off. You know what I mean? You've got to incentivize people. And um, and look after people, you know. I mean, we, we had four hundred and fifty people on on board in the end, and um, it was it was very it's very sort of like you know very very respectful. I think if if you run a business right and and you know you're the real deal. I mean, I have to say it like that. You know, I've been on the tools, I've been in the management, I've done recruitment, done the PR and uh, you know, you've gone through the mill on it and then all of a sudden people know you're the real deal. I think they respect that from you. Yeah, being authentic is, yeah. is important. And, and let me just add a couple of other bits. I mean, it's been an amazing 40 years uh, in, 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 uh, with Pimlico Plumbers yeah. and you know, you so I've been to the Supreme Court like arguing over some people who reckon they're not self-employed. A load of shit, you know what I mean? They were self-employed. And, you know, I, I, we took, Theresa May the call on Brexit, you know, and we won that one. Um, you know, there's, I don't, well, I'm sure, you know, I got OBE for I do. Uh, plumbing services. Uh, 2015. Yeah, from yeah. Prince Charles. I mean, I've got to be honest, that's probably the biggest thing 
that I've ever, ever, ever achieved. Um, you know, all the money in the world couldn't, well, they say you can buy them, but I mean, if, if you could buy them, I would have bought a knighthood. <laughs> so in 2015, when you got the OBE, describe to me the feeling, describe me, de- describe to me the process that you went through. Right, okay. So um, my, my, I go and meet my daughters like, up in that area you set up in Kent, Keston area. And, um, you know, by that time, I'd, I was divorced, you know. And again, it's an, another thing I just want to, I'm jumping back a bit, but in a successful business or successful career, there's casualties on the way. It could be your marriage. It could be you lose your house. It could be you're in debt. Your health could go. You lose friends and family. There's casualties on the way. And, um, you know, uh, that, I've been married a long time on that. And I think the, the work thing, um, you know, didn't help the situation, you know, especially when you're under pressure. Uh, but anyhow, we got through that. But anyhow, by this time, we, the marriage had, had um, called it a day kind of thing. And, um, and it's expensive. And, um, and I'll go up and meet a couple of daughters, have some uh, dinner with them uh, in one of them, I don't know what they call it, one of them Frankie and Benny places, and, uh, and the grandkids. And my daughter gave us giving me this letter. She said, oh, it's a letter that's arrived at the ass, you know, to give it to you. And uh, it was like a government thing. And I thought, oh, it's got to be tax, you know, they'll probably want a few quid. So I said, all right, I'll open it later. She said, well, open it now. I said, no, I'll open it later. You know, I said, I know what it is, you know what I mean? I don't mm. want it to upset me. They want money again, you know mm. what I mean? And uh, anyway, she, I opened it, right? I wasn't going to, I would have thrown it. If I'm being honest, I normally just throw them up in yeah, the yeah. room. And I opened it and it says like, you know, you've been nominated for OBE. And it's the government people now got to go to the prime minister to get his approval of it. Yeah. And uh, Cameron was in at the time. And, you know, I met Cameron, we worked together. And uh, he's all right, geezer, you know what I mean? I've got to be honest, he's all right. And I thought, God, I'm on a winner here. He's got to okay it. But it, it didn't really, but and I said to my daughter, you're having a wind up, aren't you? You're, you're fucking about. She said, we're not. I said, look, I know you are, you're messing up. You know, I thought they'd printed it out and trying to get yeah. me out of it. And uh, I didn't, still didn't believe it when I went home that night. And then uh, uh, a little while later, another letter comes going, right, you got it. And, uh, you, you know, you're going to go back to the palace. And that was it. I think it was in the New Year's Honours list. And, uh, well, and then I'm watching it on the telly that, you know, this plumber's got it. And, uh, yeah, it's unbelievable experience. Unbelievable. It's incredible, mate. Really, really incredible. Another thing that your, your firm is known for is the number plates, right? And I also read something that I wasn't aware of. They reckon that if all their number plates come onto the market today, they're going to be over £1.5 million. Pounds. For sure on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, some people look at that and go, that "Absolutely, that's absolute madness." I look at it and think it's really good PR because people yeah. talk about it. And you said in another podcast episode before that ninety percent of what you do, kind of now and in previous years, is all about PR and get your name out there. How important is it uh, PR and marketing and advertising yourself? Okay, it's one of the most important things in business. Often. Businesses say to me, you know, hey, there's this PR work and I can't afford it. And my answer is, can you afford not to have it? Mm. PR is so important. You could be the best company, best product, best whatever you want to be at. But if nobody don't know about it, there's no point. And, and, and I learned that many years ago. It's called recognition. It doesn't matter if you've got your name on a signboard, telly, radio, paper, little card in a window, magazine. People need to know of you. And, uh, you know, recogn- oh, that's why we built a brand up, is recognition. I mean, it's unheard of in plumbing having a brand. And the only pe- way people get a brand is it's quality and you're recognised by it. And uh, it's so important, you know what I mean? I mean, once I got going in the PR, it really got going about in, well, it got going after the, where we nearly went skimp because all of a sudden you're thinking, I've got to get this right. And then, you know, all of a sudden, I bought my first number plate probably 30 years ago called Drain, D-R-A-1-N. And it was six grand like in the auction. And uh, I was having sleepless nights, you know what I mean? I'm thinking, am I mad? You know, oh, you know, I can't be normal, can I? Why don't I want it? But something told me, you know, and when I got it, that was it, whoom, it just went. And then I used to buy one every week. I, I, I used to have an um, agent get me them. And uh, in the end, I think we had about 160 number plates. We had water, bog, lav, boiler. Lou. We had quite a few drains, yeah. Lou. Um, system uh, everything female yeah. female we had plumber we had 24 hour and I built them up over the years and, and of course they're making money but the the real value of the number plate was um, our vans were the most recognised vans on the road we had 250 vans on the road in London 
and number plates were was such an attraction. People we people was collecting them like the Eddie Stalbert of the plumbing industry. I was collecting them, and even customers were asking. I had bog one round. Can I have lab? I've had shower round. Can I have water? And you know, because their kids want to see them, and we brought out little dingy cars with all the number plates on, and you know, for for us, um, our biggest form of advertisement was our vans. So you got a good sign written van, you got a number plate on it. That's the biggest form of advertisement, and it don't cost two bob. Yeah, you know, it, it's you know amazing. I mean, I've got to be honest. Part of the my inspiration for doing the podcast and maintaining this podcast is because of you. Because I've heard so many podcast interviews with you talking about PR and a few other big entrepreneurs, big business people, and they always say, "Get known, get yourself Recognition. known." It's so important. Yeah. Um, what would you say personally, or from the business standpoint, bar you know the obvious, which is the number plates, etc. What has been your biggest like PR stunt? Well, I don't like the word stunt. But you know, or a it, PR exposure or, or method. Yeah, well, just PR. I mean, look, we we had a oldest worker in Europe work for us, Buster, um, and that's give us the most publicity ever. Basically, this this old boy used to in the old people's home. He'd come out and walk past the office, and I used to give him a score to go and have a drink. And he said, "I don't want your money, son." You know what I mean? And he was ninety nine, and uh, I said, to, "He said, give, oh, give me a bit of work for it." And I said, "Oh, well, what do you want to do, Buster? Like, you know, sweep up." Or, or, or wash the vans. I mean, I'll wash the vans. So I'm just having a little bit of fun, so he take the score. And uh, and I said to him, he said, yeah, you know, I've done it a couple of times. He said, no, look, I've got, I've got to need to work for it. All right, turn up Monday, innit? This Monday turns up at fucking five o'clock in the morning. We never used to be open all night then. In in the end, we was 24 hours. He turns up about 5.30 before me. And uh, I let him in and I put him on washing the vans. And I got onto my PR agency. I said, look, I've got this guy working for me, 99. And they went, okay, we, we do a publicity, 99 not out. You know what I mean? Or whatever, a cricket term. And that, say, the, two days later, the place was swarmed with the press. And it and it went on and on. It, and Buster was with us too. He was 104. He was on the show's papers. He brought out a, a record. Um, uh, my Generation from the U. They read none of that. And... Um, it was the best publicity ever. And it wasn't a stunt. I mean, he, he was generally... I mean, he used to wash a little van here and there. He was, he was more talking. And we bought our beer out for him, Buster's Bitter. Um, and and he, he was a proper, like, you know... you know, But he was a, he was an awkward geezer, you know what I mean? If he weren't awkward, I, probably, I could have turned him into a millionaire overnight. All he had to do was say, I drink this beer and it keeps me alive. Or I, I smoke this fag and it ain't killed me or whatever. And anyway, he worked for us right up to his under four and... Uh, just part time. I mean, in in the afternoons, he used to take his mum shopping. <laughs> Sorry, a little gag there, Steve, to liven it up a bit. <laughs> but yeah, look, look, that was look. Any publicity is great, and and I've had loads of my look. Brexit, we had, you know, I'm a Remainer, and uh, you know, don't get me wrong, we get on with it now, and and it doesn't matter Remain or or, or leave. But at the time, I was a strong Remainer, and. You know, I put a big sign on the roof, bollocks to Brexit, and we're on the railway line, and that was a massive publicity. But I believed in that. You know, I don't believe, you know, that um, the, I, I was against the Brexit. Uh, but we've had we've had so many of them. We've had female plumbers. We've had, um, uh, what's the other things we've, we've done on them? Uh, we've done lots of documentaries, you know, posh plumbers, uh, Ed, I'll get rich, um, show me your money. Uh, and then, you know, I've been on loads of news things and question time and, you know, and also, you know, with a lot of the uh, politicians, you know, I've often been up against them where, you know, I'm just, you know, a normal guy, but, you know, you can call it controversy, you call it direct or rude, call it what you want. But, you know, we've all got an opinion like ourselves. We've all got one. Yeah, you're authentic. That's what I would say about you. Yeah. Very, very authentic. I I've learned in business, Steve, just I know I'm waffling now, but um, no, it's, good. it's very important to try and be honest and direct. I mean, it's not everyone's cup of tea, but you know, you're better than beating about the bush. And Definitely. the most, most important thing I, I think in business is don't sit on the fence. You know, just look at saying, no, I'm not gonna do that. It doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong, you've got to be able to make a decision. And, um, and, and, and you know, I used to look, most of my things throughout my business was yes or no, yes or no. You know, I'm not, I'm not into gray areas. And I say to people, you ask me a question and I'll give you the answer. I either know it or I don't, or it's yes or no. And um, I think if you can do that, then 
you make decisions, then you've got, obviously you've got to take chances. And I worked out in the end, I've got a 50% chance of being right, you know what I mean? Yes or no. And then as long as you get more rights than wrong, you're on a winner. Absolutely. I was going to ask you some some uh, opinions or secrets or tips about you know being, becoming an entrepreneur. And the basic one is this. I've seen a lot of people in my lifetime, and I was a kick, I, I, I was I was this person as well. When the, when you start first start making money, that's the first challenge: making money. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> the, the first hurdle comes along. People start blowing their money and losing their money. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It takes a special person to earn that money, retain that money, invest that money, and really scale up. Yeah. And I think it's a totally different mindset. So for the people that are earning a bit of money, but they have just got a bit of money, and they're slowly but blowing it on silly stuff like clubbing or whatever yeah. else. How do you shift someone's mindset to say, okay, there's more to life than just doing that and there's a bigger playing field if you can be dedicated and disciplined and invest your money wisely into assets? Yeah, well, look, you said the obvious, but in the same token, if you're earning a few quid, you want to be able to enjoy it. And, and I don't think there's, you know, I, don't, I wouldn't say, as long as you don't waste it and be stupid with it, but you still got to have a life, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, but just go nice and slowly with it. I think it's always important, you know, don't sort of starve yourself from having a drink or, um, you know, getting some nice things in life because that, that's going to inspire you a bit more. But you just got to be sensible. My, my, my take on, on my thing was any money I've got goes back into Pimlico. Like, you know, people you say to me, invest in this, do this, do that. No. Any, I, like, I'm on a winning horse. A jockey don't get off a winning horse. So everything I got went back into it. And then I learned eventually, don't borrow money. That's, you know, because once you, you know, I know people have got to get money somewhere and, they, and, and to get moving. But, you know, after I built up and, and then borrowed off the bank, it was the biggest mistake I made. So I then learned I ain't having no more borrowing. We only earn the money, put it back in the business. And, uh, and that's what I've done for 40 years. And uh, I've never invested in nothing else. And people, oh, you've lost this and you could have had this. Yeah, that's all right. I, I'm, I'm happy, you know, stay with what I'm on. I look, I think we're all good at one thing, Steve, in life. And once you find that and, and you get the right formality for it or formation, you want a winner. You know, you might be a good boxer. He might be a good runner. Uh, you might be good at, you know, I mean, I, I'm never set out to be a businessman. All I, all I ever want to be was a plumber, and, uh, and, and, and it's just gone from there. I'd have been happy to be a plumber, earn plenty of dosh, people are nice to you, never going to be out of work, earn loads of money. And then all of a sudden, you, you see other things, you think, you know, I'm working in Eaton Place and all that, and I'm looking at these million pound flats, and I'm thinking, God, you know, this is lovely, maybe I could have some of that. And, mm. you know, I just said to you, I'm, you know, I, I bought this one for 10 mil and I mean, it's, it's the dog's bollocks, you know what I mean? I can and, imagine. And you're going to ask me, I've got a very famous neighbour, right, lives above me, right? And, you, and, and, and you're going to ask me who he is. Who is it? All right, well, I can't tell you, but I'm going to give you a clue. He's one of their most famous singer, elderly guy, still singing now. Elton John? No, you're not a million <laughs> miles away. You're not a million miles away. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Like, not a million miles away. Okay. He... he He's 80 years of age. Okay. Uh, oh, you put me in the spot. I don't know. Right. If I was to give you a clue, it's not unusual. It's not unusual. Yeah, got him. Who uh, is he? Jones. What's his name? Uh, oh, I forgot his name. I totally forgot his name. T T Tom? Tom Jones, yes. Right, but I can't tell you who he is, so yeah. who do you reckon it is? <laughs> Tom Jones. <laughs> You're not a million miles away. Now, how nice is that? He can, he can, he can have a, he can buy the block. He can, right? Yeah. He can live anywhere in the world, and we've got identical flats. Like he's got penthouse, got sub penthouse. They call it exactly the same. Got all the floor. The lifts come into the block, into your apartment. It's just me and Tom, right? With the own private lifts coming. I mean, that's that's the nuts. It's isn't incredible. It? So, like, you know, becoming, you know, this successful, uh, you know, entrepreneur selling your business uh, and and becoming this household name because you're, you're you know you're re relatively famous now charlie you know you could probably walk down the street and a lot of people recognize you probably I, I, well, definitely recognize yeah you. i mean i tell my dad this morning i said i'm interviewing charlie Mullins today he was like oh my god that's incredible you know um you know like you start you, your network starts broadening and you you know all these celebrities and yeah. you know all these other business people 
Well, and, and also MPs and governments. You mentioned about David Cameron and all these other people. That you Boris, know. I still talk to Boris now. I mean, what's that like knowing that you started in the basement with a van, start as a as a as a as a plumber, and now you've got all these people in in your phone book? I mean, what what's what's that feeling yeah. like? Well, again, I'm just going to say, you know, that's all about being successful. You know, when you're successful, you know, people want to know you. Obviously, you got to have your head screwed on, you know what I mean? You ain't got to be there, like, you know, being mugged off with them. But, you know, I've been down the street a few times. I've been bucking the power, I've been clowing the house. Uh, I've met some unbelievable people, you know, still get invited to, uh, 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 you know, different business events and and. Prize giving, as you say, you know, I, I wouldn't go one day without people coming up to me and go, "You're the plumber geezer," and you know, and well done. I mean, you know, you've got a lot of people that, that love success, but you've also got, you know, a lot of the jealous people, and you know, they want to give you a bit of stick over it. But you know, they're the ones that's got to live with the jealousy. It's more important to be successful um, than 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 to do nothing. And you know, look. For me, success is just getting the job, you know what I mean? Uh, for me, it doesn't matter if you're a road sweeper or you run a big empire. Most important thing is get a job, and then it's up to you if you want to achieve more. And we all do, you know what I mean? We all want to achieve. We do, definitely do. What strikes me about you, Charlie, obviously I've seen you loads of times on different uh, media things and also podcasts, etc. but getting to meet you in person is your energy. Like, you just <laughs> sold a company for 150 or thereabouts. You know, you've done so much in your life but you still got energy like you're a 17 year old like where did you get that from yeah well again i think it's the willpower the determination and and you know from the boxing thing never give up i mean so a few people have said to me like about retirement of course i ain't gonna retire i'm i'm as busy now i don't know if you know but I, i've started getting involved in the music business yeah i don't know nothing about it but i'm just using my business sense on it and i've got a, an artist now called rara and um you know, I met her about a year ago and, and you know, I've been guiding her in business and, and, and all of a sudden now, right, about two months ago, she was singing in front of Simon Cow. Not like, you know, um, on one of them programs, but it's yeah. a proper, like, charity thing at uh, uh, Shooting Star Hospice. And, um, you know, it, it went down well. You know what I mean? I'd organised that through different people. In business, when you start getting to know people, you know, you have to call on a little favour, you know. We get the plumber around lively, you help me out. And anyhow, I know Simon anyhow through through work, we used to work for him and uh, she got on this and she's going, well, and, and just in a couple of days time, she's off to Nashville to record an album. Now she's not young, I mean, she's about 31. I don't mean young like, you know, but she's been in the business 20 odd years, but just that guidance of saying, look, do this, do that. And you know, don't you know, don't let these people take the piss out of you. And you know, you got you got to be focused, and you 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 got to stand up for yourself. And I'll tell you now, she's going to be a big star. It's the first artist I've got. Now we're getting a lot of publicity on it, and uh, she's got a record coming out. I ain't, I'm not trying to promote it here, but she's got a record be coming out called Biker Boy, and and I'll lay any money you want. It's a winner for sure on that. So I'm doing that. I'm also got um, I'm a chairman of. Uh, Great British Radio. I've, I've DJ bought, Mike uh, Osman. Mike Osman, I've bought yeah. into that. And um, again, I don't know nothing about music, but I do know about, um, you know, the business side of it. And, you know, what a name, Great British Radio. I mean, it's a winner all day long, you know what I mean? And Mike's a great guy. Um, I've also uh, dealing in some property in Spain. I have, a, I have a villa there. I'm just buying another one and also buying a plot to build one. Um, Whereabouts in my Up in... Uh, What's it called? Los Montaras okay. up there. I have one down further down this end, like um, where is it? Uh, near Cap Mapino. But okay. but anyhow, so I'm dealing with a couple of them there. Dealing with the property here. I'm also going to be dealing with something up in uh, where I used to live in them areas and and get a plot there. You know what I mean? I mean right. they're asking on from up there, aren't they? But anyhow, they um, and you know, like I have four children. And, you know, of course, you know, I've helped them out, and they're going to do getting their their house. You know, you know what I mean? I, and you know, I think it's important that when you get successful to keep pushing it around and making sure that everybody can benefit and it, and it benefits you, you know what I mean? And uh, so, so I'm, and I'm still doing like some telly jobs and got a, um, a program coming up called Unbreakable, me and Rara on it. Um, uh, she's my partner anyhow, so it's a little bit more than just an artist, you know what I mean? Um, but, you know, I'm trying to say is that you said I've still got the energy. Uh, you're right, you know what I mean? Um, what, why, why would you stop? You know, you often find that when people stop, you know, they, they, they sort of, you know, 
they lose the interest, don't they? And, you know, yeah, I'm not short of money, uh, but in the same token, I still feel that there's a lot I can do out there. And, you know, and I, and I have to be honest, you know, I love getting involved with um, with with people that, that want to achieve something. You know, we, we used to do a lot of help with the Princess Trust. The youngsters used to come round, and a lot of them come from a difficult background. And they come, they come, and the first question they asked you was, do you really drive a Bentley? And the next question is, at the time, do you really earn a million pound? And, 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 and when you tell them, and they go, oh, I can't believe that. And then you say, but, you know, it can happen. You know, in other words, you know, we're, we're, all, we're all out there. You've all got to, it ain't going to come to you, that's for sure. You know what I mean? You've got to make it happen. But it doesn't matter whether you drive a Bentley or drive a Mini, long as you're, long as you're trying for it. And I'm a, I'm a great believer that, you know, um, once you find what you're good at and stick with it, then uh, you, you want a winner. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, being consistent, having the belief, drive, hard work, dedication, all that kind of stuff is so Let me jump in a minute, Steve. I, I know it ain't rude, it's just me, I suppose. But um, the one thing I, I've learned in, uh, I've learned now after 40 years, you've got to think big. And, and I used to think big years ago, but did I think I was going to be a millionaire? No. When I get to a millionaire, do I think I'm going to be a multi-millionaire? Yes, I did then. You know what I mean? You, you've got to start thinking big and... I think now, if, if I would have thought bigger at the time, then, you know, that 150 mil would probably be 300 mil. Hmm. Um, you have got to think big, got, but you also got to be realistic, you know what I mean? And I don't know if you know, I left school at 15, no qualifications, very little education. Obviously, I'm reading, writing, do the basics, and, uh, you know, I obviously got common sense, which ain't that common. Um, and, and you know, I look back now, and, and it's a big regret leaving at 15. You know what I mean? I must be honest with you. Really? I, oh, yeah. yeah. I look back now and I think I should have left at 14. Because, you know, you know what you... you know, yeah. In other words, you know, if you're that academic, then carry on. If you're going to do something different, then what's the point of hanging around? You might as well get out there and, and, and sort of start earning money, you know. And, and I learned that, you know, experience out there, there's no substitute for experience. And, and I'm, I can honestly sit here, as you know, and say 40 odd years in the industry, um, or not in the industry, or well, probably 50 odd years with apprenticeship uh, and that. But the fact that what you learn in business, you know what I mean? I mean, you get your education in the workplace, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. You, you've got to get out of there, you've got to get real with it. And I have to be honest, uh, you know, there ain't no magic formula. And, and I will say this to people um, you've got to go by your gut instinct. And if you feel it, it's right, then go with it. If you feel it's wrong, don't go with it. There's no better judge than you. But in the same token, watch other people and pick it up from them. I know you've touched on everything that you're pursuing now with the radio station, music, etc. Oh, and and no doubt, no doubt you're going to smash it. But I want to ask you this. So in the next five or 10 years, is there going to be another sale where Charlie Mullins gets 150, 200, 500 million from, from something? Or is there other goals in the pipeline that you're going to, you're going to take over? Okay, and well, do? That's always reasonable because I have to be honest, the American company that have taken over, they're not getting it right. And quite often, these things come up for sale and you buy them back. That ain't my intention, but, you know, it's, it's, you, who knows what's around the corner. So, you know, I know that if I win again on plumbing or any business, I know it's going to be a success. And, you know, that's my strong thing. But strange things happen, but that's not in the pipeline. But what is in the pipeline is um, for Mayor of London. That's two years, one month away. And I couldn't run for it before, even though I put myself forward because everyone would have gone, oh, he's doing it because of his company he wants to do this so that they benefit in the roads. Well, that's all gone now. I've got the time for it. And, um, you know, this calm guy ain't going to take a lot of beating. What, what, once you become Mayor of London then, yeah, uh, what, what changes could we see coming to come this great city? Uh, straight away, bicycle lanes will go. You know, and all this nonsense about fucking environment and all this, you know what I mean? It's destroying London. Businesses are, are just going bus left, right and centre. We need to get it moving again. And, you know, it's probably causing more fumes at the moment with all this, you know, you can't move anywhere. I mean, what person in their right mind turns two lanes into one? I mean, I ain't that good at maths, but it don't work, does it? Two it into one. And, you know, so I would get rid of the bicycle lanes immediately and let them have a little bit, but now they've, they've, at the moment they've got the, the most of the road. And, and ridiculous. get businesses flowing and get things moving again and, and get it back to a big city. So that's the first thing. Second thing that would come in, it'll be free travel for all apprentices. 
all apprentices, well actually I will try and do free travel for whether it's apprenticeship or a trainee or something, anybody under about the age of 18, have their affairs all paid for, which would encourage them to go and work. The most important thing is to get youngsters into work and get going. And uh, once they've got a job, they become responsible, they become part of society, and then they want to achieve. And if you think about it, then they start putting something back, so everybody benefits. You've got to look, you know, I could, I could resolve youth unemployment overnight. What you do is, when, when the youngsters leave school, they either got a job, they go to university, which is the very minority, minority lot, um, or they go into a government-funded apprenticeship. Youth employment would be gone, crime on the street would be cut down, all the money we would save with rehabilitation and people sitting at home. And, you know, I have to be honest, you know, with all the crime and the stabbings and things that go on, you, you know, often, you know, these people are not at work and, and they say, I've got nothing to do. I, I, it doesn't give you right to do it, but you don't find, you know, many people that go and work stab people. Yeah, yeah. I really want to ask you two more things, Charlie, because I know so, you're busy, man. <laughs> yeah. I'm not that busy. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I know you said you haven't invested into much else by your Pimlico plumber, and, and, and right, so, rightly so. You said the quote there, you're on a winning horse, why would you get off it? And I'm and I actually going to steal that quote. You like that one, didn't you? Perfect. Yeah. But I share with you here today what we do, <clears throat> which is Richard Hamilton artwork, the Godfather street art. I know you're not an expert and you've only just been exposed to it, but with what you've seen, what, what I've told you, and the kind of, kind, of, kind of some of the lessons there, what's your natural gut instinct and yeah. impressions okay, of well, the stuff? Um, and I'm doing a bit of a plug, I know, with myself, but, you know... Yeah, well, look, look, to be perfectly honest, as you say, I don't know nothing about art, but I asked you what type of dosh that one was. You went, it's 35 grand, but a couple of years ago, it was selling for six grand. Well, you know, I'm not that good at sums, but that looks like a winner to me. Then I look at something else that you said just sold for half a million pound, and then something else for 1.5. Um, it, it looks to me it's a great investment. I quite like the style of it, you know what I mean? I mean, it's... Uh, it's unusual and, and you know, I want it would be lovely when someone comes around my ten million pound house and I go, I've got this um what's his name again, Richard something? Richard Hamilton. Richard Hamilton, um, thing and you know, going by the little bit of knowledge I've got, the, the people that have done this before and, and, and unfortunately when they pass away, uh it all goes, you know, through the roof this stuff. So I think it's a winner for me and um you know, I'm a man of my word, so you know, let's talk turkey. Yeah, I would love to. I'd love to. So when I um, when I first started my, my first sales company when I was 24 years of age, Charlie, predominantly most of the people on that sales floor were, were men, okay? There was a few women, but it was mostly men. Yeah. Like very alpha male, testosterone, you know, geezers on yeah. the floor. And anyway, I come up with a mantra to keep their mind in check because sales is all about the transfer of enthusiasm. If you can get enthusiastic about your brand, yourself, your product, yeah, of course. then people buy into that. Yeah. So I come up with a mantra and the mantra is this, be happy, never content. Yeah. Be happy, never content. Now I used to tell the sales people what that meant. I've got my own, my own interpretation, but if I were to ask Charlie Mullins, what does be happy, never content mean to you? Well, uh, well, the obvious, you're happy, and the second thing is don't become complacent, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but look, look, there's many incentives to give people, but and, and you know, they need to believe in the product, anyhow, you know what I mean? And if you've got a good product, then, then you know, it's easier to do. But as long as you give people incentives, you know what I mean? I mean, you know, it ain't difficult. If you want to sell more of these, they get a percentage of sales, don't they? I mean, it, you know, you, you've got a most important thing, I think, in business is you know, to try and treat the people that work with you with respect and, and they'll respect you. And, and, you know, look, everyone I had at Pimlico, we, it was a family business and when anybody joined, we said, you're now part of the Pimlico family. And not every business can be family, but you, you've got to have that, you've got to have that, you know, you've got, to, you've got to have that thing where you are concerned with your work. I mean, all this bollocks they put in the paper about, I've done this to a geezer and done that. No, if you stack up, you're with us. If not, you go. You're not I mean? as simple as that. So if you've got some good people, just give them an incentive. Whether, whether it be, you know, six months, we're all going to go out and have a lovely meal. If we get this sales figure. And, and you're right, happy people in the workplace is more productive. So there's, there's many ways, ways of going around. There's not any one set thing. But I'm sure you know this anyhow. Your business is as good as the people that work for you. 
If you've got crap people, crap business. And the better way to get better people is to look after them. I mean, as I said, we brought, built a gym in our building. It was one of the best moves I've ever done. All of a sudden, they're saving money with membership. They can now go to the gym, you know, take... Competition against each uh, other. I say, and, and, and they used to love it. And then another great f uh, business tip, we, we put in a, a lovely big canteen, proper cooked food, and 24 hour, like they'd leave food out for the plumbers on call. And the difference it makes, you know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's like business or, or, or work is a long-term thing. And the more the more sort of encouraging you can make it for people. And, you know, you never come to our offices, but they was like the nuts, you know what I mean? They were, uh -huh. We had, you know, unbelievable uh, area out there. And it's just about, I think, incentivizing people and, and, you know, give them part of, you know, part of of what you're making kind of thing. And uh, they're, they're battle for you. Yeah, I really enjoyed this uh, podcast episode, Charlie. Where can people find you if they were to like follow what you're doing next? I'm on the Twitter thing. Okay. And uh, Instagram? No, not Instagram. And then the what's the other thing called? The I got a website. I think it's Charlie. At, well, Charlie. At, fuck knows. Anyhow, look, I honestly don't know. But I'm not a computer guy. But I'm saying is on the Twitter to get them, or I'll get my PR people to send you. We just opened up a new website. Okay. It, before it was simple Pimlico. Everything was Pimlico. Um, but I've got this website now of, um, you know, but I've got nothing to sell. I don't mean that only myself, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's just and, so uh, people watch Yeah, it. but look, there, there's lots of videos on it. There's lots of um, stuff that I've done. And, you know, what I'd say to somebody is watch it. And if you feel you can get something out of it, then uh, all, all for it. And you will, you know what I mean? I mean, when people just come down their office building, you know, they go, oh, I like what you've got there, Charlie, and I like this. And they go away with an idea. We all copy from somebody, we do. right? We all copy from somebody, and there ain't nothing wrong with that. And I'm just going to add that bit, and there ain't nothing wrong that you want to achieve and you want to get more money and you want to have a better life. I know life's not all about money, but you're better off to have it than not have it. You definitely are. It gives you, gives you options. Yeah. Can right. I add one more thing? The hardest thing in business I've found is employing people, right? Staff. Everybody's the same. That's the hardest thing, the worst thing. But if you get it right, you're on a winner. And, but it's also the best thing for business. I say to anybody in business, the more people you employ, the bigger the company, the more the money, if you get it right. So it's like, if I was just a plumber, on my own, I can only earn one man's money. So when, it, when I realise that I've got to get more of me, you start employing people. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just saying, if you want to go forward, you want to scale up, you've got to employ people. And if you get that right, you're on a winner. Yeah, absolutely, mate. All right, well, look, thank you very much for your time, Charlie. I don't know what you're up to now. It's a glorious day outside in uh, in Soho, London. Then if you've got uh, some other meetings to attend to, other no, podcasts. I, I, don't, I don't do meetings. I don't do meetings. Never done meetings in my life. Waste of time. Okay. You know, I'll make a decision soon. No, I'm actually off to Dubai tomorrow. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Lovely, lovely. And, do, you uh, go, do you go there often? Yeah, 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 it's I'm good, isn't it? I'm just trying to buy a villa there, like beautiful, unbelievable, beautiful. But um, I'm going to Dubai tomorrow, and then a few days off to Nashville because Rara's going off to Nashville. To uh, funny make enough, you say Nashville in in May. Me and my business partner, who's sadly not here today, he's feeling a bit unwell. Um, we're doing a, um, the Gumble Rally. Yeah, from from uh, Toronto in Canada, we go through Nashville, through America, Miami, and finishing. Um, in uh, Cuba, Havana, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. in June. So I can't wait to do that. That's yeah. also going to be a bit of PR and, well, of and marketing. Look, 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 again, uh, I, you know, it's very hard when you're doing a podcast, but giving out, you know, people to pick up certain things here. Recognition is important in business. Quality of service is important. Employing people is important. And, you know, being able to make decisions. And it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, just make a decision. Um, and the other thing is, I think, is to look after your staff. You know, I mean, look, I'm not saying I'm the easiest guy in the world, but, you know, if it stacks up, it stacks up. And, um, you know, don't let the tail wag the dog. Yeah, top man. Thank you, well, Charlie. Well, Thank well, you very much. God Thank bless. You. And uh, if you enjoyed this episode, subscribe, share it with your friends, family, and always be happy, never content. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.